Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beasts and the fish of the sea, the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will stretch out my hands against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off from this place the remnants of Baal and the name of the idolatrous priests along with the, um, along with the priests. Those who bow down on the roofs at the host of heaven, those who bow down and swear to the Lord, yet swear by Milcom. Those who have turned back from following the Lord, who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. Shall we pray? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we stand in awe of the terrible judgment of God. The judgment that is just and true and complete. Because, Father, you are a holy God, and we are not. We tremble before your righteousness like Isaiah did as he stood in the throne room of God and fell on his face, the holy prophet, who even said, Woe is me. Father, I pray that our hearts would repeat the confession of Isaiah that we are sinful people and dwell amongst a sinful people. We confess we cannot stand before your holiness. We cannot abide in the presence of a holy God. But Father, we confess our only hope in life and death is, is the mercy and grace of God in Christ who came to earth in fulfilled righteousness and took the judgment of God and shielded his people. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are a God who is both just, that you punish sin, and Father, you are a God who is a justifier, is that you forgive the guilty. Father, and it's Christ at the cross where the judgment of God and the love of God collide in this beautiful collision where we see the gospel declares the good news in light of the depravity and the brokenness of creation, the good news of Christ, which is working, who paid for the wrath and is behold making all things new and saving us and transforming us and bringing the nations into a new transformed, renewed city. Father, we look forward to that day as we stand on the cusp of the dawn where we begin to see the rays of God's grace as they break brilliantly through the, through the horizon, as we begin to see the glory of the rising sun rising with healing in its wings, the sun of righteousness. And Father, we long for the day when we shall stand in the new heavens, in the new earth, in the new Jerusalem with all the people of God who have trusted in the promises of God by faith in Christ alone, who will hear the good news of great joy of Jesus Christ as the Father sings over his people in rejoicing. Sin is no more. Pain is no more. Sorrow, the thorns and thistles of the curse have been rooted and the righteousness of God has been rooted deep and, plant and grown high. And the harvest of righteousness is seen and enjoyed for all eternity. Father, we long for that day. Father, we thank you. And pray as that is our hope in a world that is dark, that the sun is rising with healing in its wings. His name is Jesus, in whom we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. We um, begin a new book. We uh, begin. 
begin a new book, Zephaniah, and uh, and a book I uh, love. Uh, A couple years ago, we did Deuteronomy, uh, preached the whole book. Uh, Some of you uh, weeped and wailed and gnashed your teeth as we got through some of the awkward parts, but we made it through. Uh, We've been through Habakkuk, who was a contemporary of Zephaniah, and now we look at Zephaniah. Um, Some of my favorite parts of Scripture are in the uh, conclusion of Zephaniah, but as we said this morning in Sunday school, we need to get through the beginning, the groundwork of Zephaniah, the bad news of the Gospel, to be able to appreciate the sweetness and the uh, mercy and the grace of the good news of the Gospel. But if you're anything like me, uh, and the common church uh, goer, you know the stories of the Old Testament. Uh, From when I was a little boy, I heard the stories of creation and the flood. I knew the promises to Abraham and to Isaac and Jacob. I knew the exodus from Egypt. I could name many of the plagues, and I knew the Ten Commandments. I knew about the conquest of the land, the promised land where God went before them. And I knew the judges. I had my favorite judge was Ehud, the left-handed judge that stabbed the fat king uh, and and his guts came out and they won the war. I even named my fish Ehud after Ehud uh, in college. We know about Gideon and we know about Samson and we even know about the final king Samuel who faithfully said as a little boy, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And then we know the stories of David, the, the uh, shepherd king who defeated Goliath. We know about Saul, who was unfaithful. And we know about Solomon, though he was wise, his foolishness and the silliness of his heart brought him away from the one true God. But after Solomon, things get a little squirrely. And that's actually the theological term for what happens is squirrely. We hear about good kings and we hear about bad kings. We hear about weeping prophets and hopeful prophets and grumpy prophets who didn't want to go to Nineveh and didn't like the mercy and grace that he was preaching. And sometimes what we do is we gloss over these books. Some of you may have never read the book of Zephaniah, and as I said in Sunday school, that strange like cracking noise when you open it is because you've never literally opened your Bible to these pages. Uh, Thankfully, some of you have smartphones that don't make that noise. But why are these books and these prophets and these kings and chronicles and all of these things so confusing? Who in the world are Zephaniah, Haggai, and Malachi? How do they uh, relate to Josiah and Jedediah and Zedekiah? Who came first? Get um, Gedediah, Amariah, or Hezekiah. And seriously, does it really matter? We have Jesus. We have the stories. We have the flannel gaff. We have the words in red. Isn't that all we need? The answer is no. That's not all we need. And yes, it does matter. We know that because we have been told the voice of Jesus Because there are really no red letters in the Bible. All of the letters are black, and all of them, from beginning to end, belong to Jesus. They are his words speaking through his spirit. And so as we come to a people that a sola scriptura church, a church that lifts up the the, uh, authority and comes under the authority of the gospel, we cling to this banner that we teach our children All Scripture is breathed out by God. The breath of God moving through the writer. All Scripture is breathed out and profitable. What is it profitable for? For teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Both when we feel good when we read or when we feel convicted when we read. All of them are for what? That the man and woman of God may be complete whole, equipped for every good work. Brothers and sisters, we need the book of Zephaniah because it is breathed out by God. There is a reason that the Holy Spirit breathed this book and Zephaniah proclaimed these words of God. Without Zephaniah, we will not be taught the heart of God completely. 
We will not be reproved about our complacency and our waywardness. We will not be fully corrected in our wanderings. We will not be adequately trained in our righteousness. Without the book of Zephaniah, we cannot be complete. And we cannot be equipped for every good work. So as we open this strange prophet in a strange time, in a strange world, we realize that this book that was written two and a half millennia ago is still relevant today as it was so long ago. If we have ears to hear and eyes to see, and hearts to love the scriptures of God, which open this window to the heart and to the glory of God. That window that we will look for over the the next weeks is the book of Zephaniah. So let's begin. Let's set a little context. Uh, being the first one, I've done a little bit in Sunday school. I'm going to do a little bit here. Uh, context, verse one: the word of the Lord. You could spend a whole sermon right there. The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, and then you have this list, son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, the king of Judah. And yes, you had to name your child a a rhyming name with the previous generations, uh, I guess. Uh, There's a lot of Kayas and Admariahs and all these things. Zephaniah lived during the um, divided kingdom of Israel. You had the united kingdom, which was David, or Saul and David and Solomon. But unfortunately, the, the country was torn in two. And you had ten tribes to the north. And you had ten tribes to the south. And they lived in tension. But in 722 B.C., because of the wickedness of the country, they had 19 kings, and every single one of them did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And the, the northern kingdom was drugged into captivity, into Assyria, and it was no more. After that happened in 722, there was about 136 years where Judah, the two remaining tribes, existed in relative prosperity. Very, uh, they boomed economically and they thrived as a nation, though they were bankrupt spiritually. And then it says in, uh, in verse 1, the days of Josiah came a prophet. A prophet with a funny name named Zephaniah. And from 740 to 609 in the days of Josiah, this prophet reigned. And as you, if you know, Josiah was the second to last king of the southern uh, tribe. And in 586, the judgment of God came and Judah herself was also taken off into captivity. Zephaniah was a descendant of good King Hezekiah. Uh, some of you, that's your favorite book of the Bible. And it, in, uh, which being a descendant of the king enabled him to have a picture into the inner workings of the throne room. And he became a valuable advisor to King Josiah, the eight-year-old king, who, when his fa- uncle was murdered in a coup, Josiah rose up. And he was a good king. Though he was eight years old, and which is the age of Crosby, um, I can't imagine Crosby running a nation. Thankfully, they had some good um, people that were helping the boy make decisions like, we're going to play on our tablet and listen to stories nonstop. Uh, Fortunately, there was some wisdom that was going on in Judah at that time. But Josiah became the king. And um, though the country was thriving, there was the remnants of the uh, evil king Manasseh. Idolatry and uh, wickedness and corruption had become so entrenched in the fabric of the nation, they had forgotten the law of God. And they didn't just forget the, the law of God. They literally could not find it. They didn't know where it was. Even though they did, they went through rituals and ceremonies that they had known. They did not have the law of God. 
And we don't know how long that had been, but we know the wickedness of the king and the decay and decrepit uh, remains of the temple were indicative of a nation that was serving themselves and living for themselves and not for the one true magnificent God who had worked. A little bit of um, background in 2 Kings, it says, And Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. It was probably in one of the storerooms all the way back because it wasn't where it was supposed to be. It wasn't a priority. It was off to the side. They talked about the Lord much, but they didn't read His Word clearly because they couldn't even find it. This was a time where they didn't have Bibles at their homes or they bring up their smartphones. They didn't have them. They have to come together and worship to hear God's Word, and it was not a part of their worship. It's a good lesson today why our church... Uh, read so much scripture. I've had people criticize, you got, we read way too much scripture, and I say, you know you just said that out loud, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, we as a Baptist, uh, the Baptist church, the SBC, often talk about the inerrancy of the God, and we love the word of God, but so infrequently do we read the word of God in our worship. And that's why we have so much that we try to saturate our service. But Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, who read it before the king. And when the king heard the words of the book of law, he tore his clothes. He weeped, saying, For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written in it concerning us. Josiah as he was older at this time, instituted great reforms in Judah. He tore down the altars uh, to foreign gods and he chased away the priests of the foreign gods. His reforms were so significant and his heart so fervently followed the Lord and was cut with repentance that Scripture says this, before him there was no king like Josiah who turned to the Lord with what? All his heart with all his soul and with all his might. What a wonderful description of the legacy that a king or administrator or a pastor would leave. According to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him rise after him. Zephaniah was an important part in the reforms of Josiah. He was the prophetic voice that called out to the people to fear the righteous indignation of God and to humbly seek his mercy. The words of Zephaniah, though, are not just Zephaniah's words. Like my words on a Sunday morning are my words. And the Spirit uses my imperfect words to accomplish his task. But the words of Zephaniah, as we read them, are God's words working and breathing through Zephaniah, through his personality, through his expressions. These are the words of God. And because the presence of God would consume the people, God sent his words through the voice of a prophet. Verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah. The presence of God was too terrible to, for the people to endure. Instead, the words of Zephaniah were sent. And to misuse these words, any of the words that we have recorded in Holy Scripture is to misuse the very presence of God, which we would never do. Notice, as we read these words, the words of Zephaniah, the first six verses as we look at this morning, are fearful and they're terrible. They're not your best life now, name it and claim it kind of stuff. And I want you this morning to know right off the bat that the wicked will be disposed of and swept away in God's devastating judgments. You have to remember this. We cannot understand and appreciate the good news of the gospel until we realize the bad news of the gospel. That a holy God is righteously bringing his judgment on a sinful people who have squandered and committed cosmic treason, who have marred his very good creation, 
for themselves. And as we look at our world, we can see the evidence of the wickedness from racism to environmental pollution to corruption to um, health and sickness in our world. It is a consequence of sin because of what we have done living for ourselves. And uh, Zephaniah brings the heavy lumber right off the bat. The wicked will be disposed of and swept away in God's devastating judgment. That's not good news for any of us, including this, and most especially me. So what, how we respond is we this. We need to heed the promised judgment. This is a promise of God, and God always keeps his promise. Judgment is coming. But then we need to halt, or they need to halt, and we need to halt, their polluted worship. Heed the promised judgment and halt the polluted worship. Let's begin as we look at how we heed the promised judgment. Verse 2, I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. These words are terrifying. It immediately grabs our attention because he comes out right off the gate. He doesn't soft pedal it, doesn't slowly build up to where he gets all excited, take off his jacket and shouts and spit. Man, right off the bat, he hits him hard. The severity of God's righteous indignation on the wicked who have mangled and twisted God's very good creation. Notice the word that he uses here is, I will sweep away. It's the Hebrew word for gather. And it's all used throughout the Old Testament for things like death, like harvest, and like war. Let me give you a couple examples of each one of them. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man full of years and was gathered to his people. He was swept away from the land of the living and brought into his forefathers who had died. Then in Deuteronomy, it says, uh, when talking about the Feast of Booth, you shall keep the Feast of Booth. When you have gathered, when you have harvested, when you have brought the grain from the fields and gathered it together in the threshing floor and your wine press. And then we see often throughout Judges and throughout Joshua, but Sihon did not trust Israel to pass through his territory, so he gathered all his people, he brought together, he swept these people together to encamp against Jahaz and to fight with Israel. The gathering of God's people. God, Jeff and I's prophetic words communicate that one final harvest of God's judgment is coming. A harvest where the sickle is held not by other forces, but the sickle of God's judgment is held by the very hand of God. And it will be a storm that is so overwhelming that nothing will be able to stand against this mighty judgment of God. Verse 3, he continues... I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heaven and the fish of the sea, the rubble or the stumbling blocks with the wicked. <clears throat> I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. This coming day of harvest judgment will be a day of darkness and doom. It will clear the land of the weeds and the thorns and the thistles of corruption and rebellion that man's pride and foolishness and sin have twisted and mangled creation. And as you read this, notice what the things that will be swept away. This imagery and this darkness that begins to see man and beasts and birds and fish. That harkens back to, generation, um, to Genesis chapter 1. The days of creation when fish were created and birds and beasts and finally man. The judgment of God it will be so severe and so complete that it is a reversal of this work of creation. It is going back to the basics, to the foundation. It will be a day of darkness and, and uh, chaos and this day of the Lord that will come. 
For God is retracting his edict to man that you are to work the field and take care of this. This domain that man has been given is being brought back and God is saying, I will undo the sin and the the pride and the wickedness that you have done because it is so thorough and it has so much tainted my creation. And as we read this, as the sickle brings down the beasts and the birds and the fish, that God's judgment is severe and it's complete and it's terrifying. Zephaniah declares with bold and shocking terms that no one, no one not, uh, will be able to uh, stand before God, not even the fish, the fish who were just fine with the flood that came at Noah's time. Not even the fish are saved from this complete, thorough judgment of God. It will be as if before this work of creation. But sometimes when we read these verses, you think, well, man, we just got done with Mark. And Jesus was kind. And Jesus was loving. uh, And he was gracious. But this... I don't like this Old Testament stuff because God is so severe and he's harsh and he's, he's wrathful. These such words are simply not true. I want to see the words of Jesus himself. It says, the Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers. It's that same idea, all the rubble with the wicked. Jesus gleans these words from Zephaniah to talk about this day of judgment that's coming. When we think, well, we're New Testament people. There's lots of grace here. We're under grace, not law. But the reality is we are under Christ. And the day of judgment is coming, and it is fierce, and it is grace. And the day of judgment, the ultimate day of the Lord, is the day when Christ comes, and he vanquishes sin, and he puts down his enemies, and he brings his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. The great, on the great day of the Lord, the wicked will be disposed of and swept away. We have looked in our uh, catechism, and the question is, what is sin? And if you can't answer this question, you need to be here on Wednesday nights. What is sin? Sin is rejecting and ignoring God in the world he has created, rebelling against him by living without reference to him, not being or doing what he requires in the law. And what has sin done to our world, to our governments, to our relationships, our families. It's resulted in our death and the disintegration of all of creation. As we look at our world, we see a world where, uh, that is disintegrating because we have lived for ourselves and our glory without reference to God. But what does God do? A couple questions later. Will God allow our disobedience and our idolatry to go unpunished? Will God not punish sin? Is he, like some people say, well, in the end, love wins, and Jesus will pat us on the head and say, I took care of it. No. No, every sin against the sovereignty, the holiness, and the goodness of God, and against his righteous law, um, will be punished. And God, for God is righteously angry with our sin. Not, right, not angry like we do with our children and lose our minds, but he's righteously angry, in control, like when we see a man die under the knee of a police officer for nine minutes. That anger we have, that anger that we have when we see a little child that is, that is hurt, and victimized and murdered. That anger you have when you see people go in nursing homes and abuse the people there. That anger that we have. That's a righteous anger. Because that is true sin. And we don't just sit back and say, no big deal. God will move and punish sin. 
He's righteously angry. He's in control. He knows what he's doing. Not at once does he lose control. And he will punish that sin in this life and in the life to come. One of the questions I ask, uh, I, I tell the t- children, I said, God punishes sin in two places. One, in hell. And the kids don't like when I use that word. But that's where God punishes sin for eternity. And the other place that God punishes sin is at the cross. Either your sin will be punished in hell, or your sin will be, has been punished at the cross. And as we see this reality of the judgment of God, we hear the promises of God in the, vo- the voice of Zephaniah, I will utterly sweep away everything in the face of the earth. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth. They are shocking and they're jarring. But God's judgment is real. We must know that. And the day of the Lord is coming and the judgment will be swift and it will be terrible. And no one will be able to stand before the sickle of his per- perfect justice. Ocean Park, as we hear these words, don't discount it as some Old Testament mumbo jumbo of a long way, a long time ago. That's not the case. Heed the promise of God's judgment. If you don't, you will never find the promise of hope that is weaved so magnificently in the book of Hezekiah, or not Hezekiah, that's not a book, of Zephaniah. They were friends, um, related. So remember this, the wicked will be disposed of and swept away in God's devastating judgment. Remember, the wicked is not those people. The wicked is these people. The wicked is me. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Don't forget that. So as you see, we need to heed this promised judgment, but we also need to halt this polluted worship. I would imagine that one of the responses to Zephaniah as he declared these words for the people of Judah would be like, aha, amen, brother. It's about time that those people got their due. Those people need to be wiped out. Those people need to be swept off the face of the earth. That's good news. See, the only problem with Judah um, herself was she was not exempt from this all-consuming day of the Lord. Because don't we do that? I know, Jesus, I'm saved, and you're going to get it in the end. Like, we use the gospel as some bat that we hit people with and to justify and make ourselves feel better. But the reality is the gospel is the bat that has hit us and has knocked us out of our self-centered, self-focused way that we can now see Christ clearly. And Judah, in verses 4 through 6, is about to get hit with the bat of the reality of the bad news of the gospel. I, verse 4, will stretch out my hand against Judah. What? and against the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I can imagine at this moment there was probably an audible gasp as they listened to this. How could judgment fall on Judah? These are the people of God. This is the city of God. That's the temple right there. I just got back from there. God has promised in Genesis 49 the scepter would never remove from Judah. He promised that he would never remove the lamp from David's house. Jerusalem is the place where God's very presence is enthroned in the temple. But God says, I will stretch out my hand against Judah, against Jerusalem, against the city of David, against the people of God. Just like I did against the Egyptians. Notice the words that the promise of this coming judgment is the same promise that was given to to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the people out from among them. That power that worked um, 
magnificently to bring the people out of captivity is now being focused on the people of God to bring them into captivity. Why? Because all the people, all people are guilty. But Judah, the people of God know better. Do you, have you ever told your kids when they have a friend over or that doesn't know really the rules of the house and they get into something and they make a mess and it's like, you, you sort of scold the visitor kid, but what do you do when you look at your kid? You know better. You know better. And you, you, you do this. And G, what is happening now is Zephaniah, or the hand of God, is through the words of Zephaniah looking at Judah and said, You know better. Why? You have the law of God. Well, at least you had it and you lost it. God has revealed himself to you. You have the law and the prophet. God is, has dwelt among you. You know better. Though they have the favor of God as their chosen people, they have rejected him. And Zephaniah is a prosecuting attorney, and he points his finger dramatically at Judah and said, you are guilty. And he gives them four evidences. Four reasons for their guilt in Article A, B, C, and D. And though these are four uh, distinctive corruptions and polluted worship, they all came from the same tainted poison spring. And until that spring is um, cleansed and purified, their worship will be worthless and pugnacious in the, in the nostril of God. Read Isaiah 1. Notice this first thing is depraved worship. I don't have, I should have put it behind me. Depraved worship. Verse 4, I will cut off from this place the remnants of Baal in the name of the idolatrous priests along with the priests. These people have turned to whatever they think will produce power and pleasure. And usually when people seek power, they look for money. And usually when pleasure, they, it's sexuality. And God's people had turned to the false god of Baal. And you can sort of see Baal behind me. He's not much, but he was well thought of by the Canaanites. Uh, he was the Canaanite god of prosperity and fertility. And the Baal controlled the fertility of the people and the land and the animals. And you needed, as a Canaanite Baal, because you needed your crops to grow. Because without crops, you couldn't have food and you couldn't buy things. So you needed Baal to give you fertile land and to make your animals have babies and make your, your wife have children to so continue this legacy. So the Canaanites went before them to this God and said, give us fertility, give us power. But there was a catch to move Baal, because we remember, uh, I think it's Elijah or Elisha, one of those two, never got it, never got the two straight, but were the prophets of Baal, and they had to do um, crazy things. And to be able to move Baal to action, they had to do things that are reserved in marriage between a man and a woman alone, in public, in the temple, uh, in lewd and vulgar acts to be able to allow this fertility God to bless their land. All that Baal would be moved to bless their land, give them power and prosperity. And such actions are an affront to the one true God, Yahweh, who is working to redeem his people from corruption and sin and brokenness. The very thing that Baal required to get him to move, to be able to move these people from brokenness to wholeness. And that the people of God, God's chosen people, are serving Baal. And they're, they're offering their lives even to the point that they're offering their children as sacrifices in the fire that their crops and their pigs and their wives would have fertility. And God's anger burns 
because he sees his people who he loves, who he has designed to desire him and walk in his ways and be like a tree that is planted behind, beside springs of water that bears forth fruit in its season to thrive on him. And they're perverting themselves to Baal. And they're victimizing themselves for power and prosperity, for what they need when the God who loves them wants to give themselves to him. Ocean Park, it's true today in our illicit culture that drips with sensuality and greed. Everywhere we look, people are searching for power and pleasure by any means possible. They offer their bodies and they offer their money to the gods of this age, to contemporary Baals, in order to get what they really want. Yet fulfillment is only found, satisfaction is only found in knowing God. As St. Augustine says, we are restless until we rest in thee. Depraved modern day Baalism has left us broken and empty. God is jealous for his people and he will not sit idly by as his beautiful creation and his image bearers are continued to be exploited and destroyed by themselves and each other. God's judgment will fall on all who practice such depraved worship. The second area is self-serving worship. Verse 5, the beginning, those who bow down to the roofs and to the hosts of heavens. The people worshiped the sun and the moon and the stars, and it was common in ancient worlds, and it's still common today. It was this that God warned his people out in the book of uh, Deuteronomy. Beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven. And when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you be drawn away. Drawn away from where? The one true, eternal, all-sufficient God who we were designed to find completion in and serve these gods of our fancy and our wonder and, and their spectacular, even though they reflect the glory of God, we make them the object of our worship. Things that your Lord, your God, has allotted to all the people in the whole of heaven. And what would the people would do on private housetops? Each person would worship in a manner that pleased them. If you belong to God, brothers and sisters, you cannot worship anything or any way that seems good to us. Idolatry, I don't have a slide, is worshiping the creation rather than the creator. Finding satisfaction in the creation rather than the creator. There is only room in our heart for one God, one object of our worship. Who, Ocean Park, will you worship? The starry host of our time is whatever that's considered awesome. Vacation experiences, clothing that gives us status symbols, image-making cars, the latest technology. How do we know that the objects that we desire have become the objects of our worship? Follow your money. How much money do you sacrifice to have these things? Follow your time. How much time do you spend daydreaming and, uh, about how to get these things? How much time do you spend researching how to procure this thing? And follow your words. How much do you talk about these things when you're with your friends and your family? Follow your emotions. What makes you angry? What makes you uh, despondent? What makes you that if it was something that was removed from your life, make it not worth living? That is your idol. If you belong to the one true God, Zephaniah is telling us, there is a pattern of living and a system of values that is in harmony with our Creator. We do not offer ourselves to the things of this world or give our worship to them and throw our leftover scraps to the one true God. We either follow the pattern of our Creator or set ourselves against His judgment. God's judgment will fall on all who chase after self-serving worship. The third thing, and I know we're running out of time, is duplicitous worship. 
The end of verse 5, those who bow down and swear to the Lord, yet swear by Milcon, or a Hebrew version of their king. True worship is not to be mixed with truth and error. Truth is not an alloy. We cannot worship the uh, true king of heaven with the false gods of earth. The people of Judah were following the laws of the Old Testament with its festivals and its sacrifices and its dietary laws and its rituals, but they were also giving allegiance to the religious gods of their day, the Molechs, the Baals, the gods of of the Canaanites. Religiously, they were speaking out of both sides of their mouth, trying to glean the benefits from Yahweh and trying to glean the benefits of Molech and Baal and Asherah. When you try to have the best of both worlds, you have none. Judah could not serve Yahweh and Molech. Either you trusted the promises of God or you trusted the promises of Molech. Ocean Park, the same is true today. You cannot serve two lords. You cannot serve God in politics. One will guide you and direct how you view the world. It's either God or Trump and Biden. You cannot serve both. You cannot serve God in money. One will be the source of security for your future. You cannot serve God in pleasure. One will provide both true satisfaction to your heart, and one will fail you every time. Let me ask you, are you duplicitous in your worship? Does your heart easily wander over the gods of the earth? There are six days you devote yourselves to the gods of this world, and then one day, one hour, if you're lucky, twice a month, You'll devote yourselves, if you're paying attention, to the worship of the one true God. It's easy to sing the songs and recite the creeds and listen to the sermons on Sundays, all the while going back to the gods of this world at 12.01 or Monday morning. God's judgment will fall on all whose worship is duplicitous. And then we see the final one in uh, D, complacent worship. Verse 6, those who have turned back from following the Lord, who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. There were those in Judah who followed after other gods and devoted themselves to false gods, and there were many who didn't follow Yahweh at all. They didn't even give him the time of day. They stopped the sacrifices. They ignored the rituals. They shunned the festivals. They didn't follow Molech or Baal or Yahweh. They followed their own way. They didn't seek the Lord. They followed their own heart. Disney says it's okay, so they did it. You know, Disney wasn't around back then, but same, same stuff. They did not inquire of the Lord's will. They did what was right in their own eyes. See, the Judah, the practice of Judah, they were practical atheists. They were living, um, they rebelled against God not by sinful acts, but by living without reference to God in his world. They ignored the God and never thought about it, never gave him time of day. Ocean Park, I believe in this now 21st century, uh, this is the single greatest threat to every one of us. We, the reality is, our culture really doesn't need God. Why? We have insurance. We have weather reports. We have retirement accounts. We have Social Security, unemployment, life insurance, supermarkets, education. We have Google. What more do you need? We must heed the words of Zephaniah. You can't ignore God and be safe. Failure to seek God after the Lord is a sin which will bring an exterminating judgment. One of my pastoral mentors, Shane Waters, says this quote, the amount that you prayed yesterday is the amount that you needed God. And I probably have a hunch that quote is as painful for you as it is for me. Following God requires a conscience directed effort. Devotion towards God does not just happen. You have to seek the Lord and inquire of his heart. I've watched my son grow from a scrawny little kid to a a young man who can now beat me up. 
And it's reason because at one in the morning, he's eating chicken and protein and these things. And he's working out and he's doing push-ups and all of these things. Why? Because he wants to be strong so he can play football. And he's devoted himself to that. Financial fitness, you have to budget your money and control your spending. Debt-free living doesn't just happen. Debt-full living happens. Spiritual fitness begins when we humble ourselves and seek the Lord. One of the commentators put it this way. He said, when God's people live as though they have been sought and delivered by the creator of the universe, and when they turn away to consult with themselves as if they were their own protectors, God becomes angry. Not because he's some petty old bag who wants attention. He knows that they have turned down their own destruction and his good creation, his loss. God loves his people too much to allow them to follow their heart. He knows that we need him. Be warned. God's judgment will fall on those whose worship is duplicitous. Because the wicked, Jeremiah, or Jeff, Zephaniah, whoever we're talking about, the wicked will be disposed of and swept away in God's devastating judgment. Coo, really, really brief stuff. And I won't have you turn there, but I want you to listen. Applications. I'd leave you here on a cliffhanger, but you need to hear the truth of this gospel. One, we must fear God's judgment. Romans 2 says, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Chapter 1, do you suppose, O man, that the th judge of those who practice such things and does them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Paul, New Testament, all full of grace, right? Judgment is coming. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Verse 8 and 9 of chapter 2, But for those who are self-seeking and who do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. Ocean Park, the judgment of God is coming. We must fear it. But the judgment is not just for those people, all the people that didn't show up today and all the people outside. Verse chapter 1, verse 28 and 29, we are quick in Romans 1 to talk about the, um, the uh, disregarding the pattern of, of a man and a woman in marriage and embracing and endorsing, but just as chilling an indictment is verses 28 and 29, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, His people, His image bearers, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. We're like, yeah. Yeah, go get those people. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, ouch, malice. Ooh. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceitfulness, maliciousness. They are gossips. All have sinned. Every single one of them. Every single one of us fears God's judgment because we are in the crosshairs of an almighty, holy God. We are not safe. But listen, listen. Romans continues, we must run to God's shelter. Romans 5, 6, and 9. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, for the wicked, for one might scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. That's not us. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, while we were still wicked, while we shook our face, our hand in the face of Almighty God, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been justified, declared righteous, much more we will be saved by him from the wrath of God. I want you to hear this. The wrath of God is coming. And there is a shelter in the storm. His name is Jesus Christ. 
There are two places that God, the holy God, punishes sin. It's in hell for eternity or at the cross where his wrath was poured out on Christ so you wouldn't drink that cup. Question now, will you find shelter in the cross of Christ or you stand before God's sickle of judgment on your own account, on your own merits? I pray that you will heed the judgment of God, this promised judgment. And I halt the polluted worship of our hearts, because knowing that the wicked will be disposed of and swept away in God's dem- devastating judgment. And the only safe place is in the shadow and the shape safety of the rock of ages, Jesus Christ at the cross. Trust him now. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you for the cross. We thank you that you are good and that you punish sin. You're not a absent-minded, careless judge, but you're a judge that does what is right. But you're also gracious and compassionate that you sent Christ the shelter from the storm, and you have called us to find shelter in Christ at the cross. In his name we pray. Amen.